Hi guys, we're going to start in a minute. Can someone just let me know if you can hear me and see me well? Great, so let's make a start, okay? Thank you very much to everyone um, for joining today to our fourth um, free online webinar. Um, thank you so much to everyone that's been supporting everything I've been doing on Instagram. The support has been great. And thank you to everyone um, for your kind comments. Um, just let's get started. So quick about me, uh, a bit about me if you haven't already met me before. My name is Ephraim. I'm a medical student studying at Barts in London School of Medicine in London. And um, I'm a private, I've been a private tutor for about three years now, but ever since lockdown started, um, many of you have uh, had your studies disrupted, your schools closed, and I know how hard that can be, especially during your A-levels, probably one of the most crucial uh, periods of your time in your education. So that's why I'm here to help. I'm here to provide you with some kind of education weekly to keep you um, on your toes when it comes to biology. So I'll be teaching you every week uh, for as long as I can, and try and get you through these really complex topics in A-level biology. Okay. So a couple of rules before we start. Um, please don't mess around during the lesson. Um, stay muted at all times. If you have a question, please do raise your hand um, or leave a message on the Q&A chat and I'll be going through um, any questions we have during the lesson as well and also towards the end. So any, to take any notes you need, um, these slides will be available on our shared drive at the end of the lesson. Um, but just a quick bit of motivation for you. You're doing your A-levels, okay? These, these A-levels only last two years and for you guys entering year 13, you've only got one year left, okay? This one or two years will probably be the most valuable period um, in your entire career. These two years will decide what career you go into and that career will be the career you stay in for the rest of your life. So if you ever start to run out of motivation, think what motivates me? Is it your uni application? Is it a career that you want to go into? Think about those and that will help you to stay motivated during these times. So A-levels, UCAS, UCAT, they're all really difficult to get your head around, okay? And if you guys don't have any questions or any queries, do let me know and I'll try and get back to you. A couple of exam revision tips for any of, the, uh, for any of you that are new here. Um, I tell my students uh, to stay away from these pretty notes that you see on Instagram because they waste a lot of time to make them and the majority of you don't actually go and revise them, okay? So what I recommend is spend the most of the time um, trying to understand the content really fully and committing it to memory. Anything you don't really understand, make it into a flashcard, put on Quizlet, make a paper flashcard to help you to better understand the content. I really vouch for um, the CGP revision guides and all their products, so definitely if you don't have uh, the revision guide for your spec, do go ahead and get one. The textbook's great too, but you can probably notice that the textbook is about three or four times bigger um, than the CGP revision guide. And there's a lot to understand. So just use that as wider reading for practical knowledge. And obviously, uh, past papers, exam, question, exam questions, they are best friends. So make sure you're doing as much as you can. Uh, you're looking at the mark scheme, trying to memorize the mark scheme if possible. Um, and if you finish with your exam board, go onto a different exam board and pick out those questions as well. There's no limit to how many questions you can do. Let's get started. So last, um, let me just get my PowerPoint up. Last lesson, we, were, we started looking at biological molecules. Okay, probably one of the more important topics in, in your AS and probably the first for topic in AS for many of you. So last lesson, we talked about water, some of the main functions of water and also the structure of water. Let's do a quick recap of those molecules that we looked at last time. So H2O, that's H2O. We know they have uh, partial charges involved to produce that electronegativity. And if it doesn't make sense to you, please go back um, and watch last week's webinar. But that's your partial charges for water. What you, what you do is draw two of them. And then your hydrogen bond is in between. And then you'd label that as your hydrogen bond. Please don't write H bond in your exam. You'll lose your marks. Okay. So this hydrogen bond requires a lot of energy to break. And that's, that gives um, water really unique properties. So we talked about things like high specific heat capacity, latent heat evaporation, cohesion, adhesion, um, also the formation of ice and how it's um, less dense than liquid water. So that hydrogen bond gives water the majority of its properties. And if this doesn't make sense, again, go back and watch last time's lecture. 
We also then moved on to carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are the basis of life. So the, these molecules make up ATP and ATP is released and broken down to release energy. Okay, so these are really, really important molecules. We then looked at the monosaccharide alpha and beta glucose and how to draw them. Uh, we then looked at ribose and deoxyribose, the pentose monosaccharides, and then how to draw them as well. Um, we talked about condensation reactions to form our 1,4 glycosidic and our 1,6 glycosidic, glycosidic, glycosidic bonds. Then we talked about these important disaccharides, which you do need to remember. Um, we then talked about some of the major polysaccharides, so three or more monosaccharides joined together. And the two that you should be aware of are starch. Starch is made up of two components, amylose, amylopectin, and then glycogen in humans. Also, cellulose we also mentioned quickly at the end, and that's mainly to do with cell walls. If any of this doesn't make sense, please, I do suggest going back and uh, reading up or reading the lectures, watching the lectures on amylose, amylopectin, and all these other polysaccharides that we learned about. But let's move on to what we're going to do today. We're going to look at lipids today, okay? And you're going to hear me say this a lot about each of these biological molecules. And it's true because each one of them are really, really important, okay? So lipids are really important in both humans and plants, okay? In humans, lipids um, act as a store of excess glucose. So all that fat um, around our legs, around our organs, around our abdomen, this is storing our excess glucose because we never want to waste any ingested glucose. So we store all of it as um, lipids. Okay. And the main molecule that um, these lipids are stored as is something that's known as triglyceride, and we're going to look at that structure in just a minute. So a couple main functions that lipids serve. Okay. So lipids, as I said before, act as this reserve energy. Okay. And we can break down lipids and fatty acids in respiration to release energy from that. Lipids also surround the majority of our organs and kind of give it some cushioning to, pr uh, to protect them. They also provide animals... Um, many polar animals with some kind of insulation against heat and also some buoyancy. Um, but probably the most important function of lipids is how they make up cell membranes. And you've probably heard about the topic, the phospholipid bilayer. The phospholipids is just a modified triglyceride, and triglyceride is one of our main lipid storing molecules. So lipids in the human body are stored in cells called adipocytes. These are your fat cells. So fat cells are um, this picture over here. It's just a normal cell membrane, nucleus, nothing, nothing too extravagant, but it's just full packed with um, adipose tissue or fat tissue. And the main storage molecule is triglycerides again. So let's look at these triglycerides that I've been talking about. So triglycerides are the most common type of lipid and they have really broad roles um, in the human body, but mainly they're used for storage and uh, for energy, reserve energy. Okay? Um, triglycerides can have two components. There's a glycerol component and a fatty acid component. And the reason why fats are so good at releasing energy is because fatty acids have really, really long chain lengths and each of those chains can be broken down. Uh, into their several bonds, and each of those bonds can be broken to release energy in an exothermic reaction. So one thing I like to highlight is the elements that are involved, and I've seen many uh, multiple choice questions, especially if you're on OCR and AQA. They ask what elements are involved in each of these biological molecules. So in carbohydrates, the only three elements you should ever be thinking about is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and it's the same with triglycerides. Triglyceride. It's only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, nothing else. So let's look at this basic triglyceride structure. First, this is a really basic, um, a basic diagram. So what you have is something called a glycerol. So I'm going to put a G. This is your glycerol molecule. And then connected to your glycerol, you have um, fatty acids. And since this is known as a triglyceride, we have one, two, three fatty acids making that triglyceride. Okay? And you can have different types of triglycerides. You can have unsaturated or saturated. So saturated means all the bonds are saturated, so you find no double bonds. Unsaturated means there's at least one double bond which uh, forms a kink in the chain, uh, which makes it a liquid fat, such as oils. Okay? So the saturated fatty acids have no double bonds, so no kinks, so they can really get compacted together. Um, so each of these lines is representing a, a triglyceride. Since there's no kinks in the chain, you can make a really solid structure. This solid structure are things like butter and margarine. So when your parents tell you that don't eat too many saturated fatty acids, they're talking about these solid fats, okay? Saturated fatty acids, solid fats, no double bonds, things like butter and margarine. That kink in the chain um, in 
unsaturated fatty acids, if I draw one over here, uh, makes them less able to stack well together and get tightly compacted. This means they become a liquid. Let's go into a bit more detail looking at uh, triglycerides. So that glycerol component, okay? Let's draw a glycerol component. So a glycerol component is, um, is looking a bit like this, okay? So if I was to draw just glycerol by itself, this is what it looks like. So we've got three OH groups or hydroxyl groups, and the rest are filled in with hydrogens. For those of you that, that do chemistry, um, does anyone want to try and name it in the chat, what this uh, molecule is? So, I mean, if you can go ahead and try it, but for those of you in chemistry, it's a good application style question to get your head around. So this molecule is propan, because we have three carbons. Um, and yep, perfect. Propan, one, two, three, trial, perfect. Um, so that's how you'd name this component, also known as glycerol. Okay, that's the glycerol component. Now let's look at this fatty acid component. So fatty acids, as the name suggests, has acids in them. And the acid or the only organic acid that you ever learn about is um, carboxylic acids. So your carboxylic acid um, looks like this. Make sure that your covalent bond between the carbon and the oxygen um, is between the carbon and the oxygen, not the hydrogen. So this would be wrong, for example. That would be wrong. Okay, so just bear that in mind. So that's your fatty acid. Um, you can add as many carbons as you want to increase the chain length. I'm not going to draw the hydrogen thing, that takes too long. Okay, that's your fatty acid, that's your glycerol molecule, and there's, there's three of them in total to make your triglyceride. Let's try and join them together. So as we know with all biological molecules, the formation of any uh, polymer or any dimer is a condensation reaction. Condensation means we release water. So where are we going to find that release of water in this molecule? Okay, so water is your H2O, okay, H2O, H, H and O. So that's our water component that we're going to form when we do this condensation reaction. And whatever's left over is your ester bond. Okay, ester bonds are the ones involved in triglycerides. So underneath, let's draw an ester bond. Okay, so remember, you have to form your water first, so just remove your water. And whatever you're left with is that O. That O then joins up. And then you form your ester bond. It's really simple. And you do that three times. So the ester functional group is this. Those of you who are doing chemistry, this should be really easy for you. But that's your ester functional group. It's really important. If you ever see that, you know it's a fatty acid or a triglyceride. So that's your triglyceride. To break this down, obviously, it's the reverse. The reverse of breaking any polymer down into monomers is uh, always a hydrolysis reaction. So you add water in. You add water in to reform those two separate um, hydroxyl groups. Let's look at phospholipids. Phospholipids are basically modified triglycerides. So if I was to draw back that really simple um, diagram of what a triglyceride looks like, that's your glycerol molecule and then your three fatty acids. As I said before, phospholipids are modified triglycerides. So what I'm going to do is remove one of our fatty acids and replace that um, with a phosphate. Okay? You don't need to be able to draw all the bonds in this. If you're interested, the phosphate ion is PO4 three minus. Again, if you do chemistry, that should be really simple for you. That's your phospholipid, a modified triglyceride. You get one, rid of one of your fatty acid chains, replace it, um, with a phosphate ion. So once we've changed this chemical structure, you're obviously going to change um, the, the, some of the chemical features of this molecule. And the most relevant, the most pertinent um, feature of phospholipids is how they make up uh, the basis of phospholipid bilayers. Okay, so this phosphate, this phosphate head, um, this makes up your hydrophilic phosphate, phosphate head. Hydrophilic phosphate head. So hydrophilic, I mean, it's, it likes water. Philia means liking something. Um, hydrophilia means liking water. So this phosphate can attract water. And the reason it can attract water is because it has a charge to it. The fatty acid tails, this is your hydrophobic fatty acid tail. Okay. And the reason it's hydrophobic, again, because it has no ions, it repels the water. So if we were to look at a um, phospholipid bilayer, you can clearly see um, our tails, our uh, fatty acid tails inwards, and our phosphate heads making the outwards. This, that gives you um, the phospholipid bile a really unique property, meaning that it can't, it's not permeable to water. And the reason it's not permeable to water is because these fatty acid chains repel the water. 
That's really important to understand. Water, however, can get through the phospholipid bile. That's the cell membranes topic, and they go through specialized channel proteins called aquaporins. Another really important um, component of this phospholipid bile, which is also um, a lipid, is our cholesterol. Cholesterol is again another modified um, triglyceride. Okay, it's made in the liver and other locations in the body, and it makes up. Um, it gives the, the phospholipid bile rigidity and decreases fluidity. So if I were to mention any two things about cholesterol, you say it increases rigidity, decreases fluidity. That comes straight from the basket. So these are the three main uh, lipids we've talked about, triglycerides, phospholipids, and cholesterol. So this is basically a summary slide of everything we've just talked about. That's it. That's all you need to know about uh, uh, lipids. Very simple topic. Now let's move on to uh, proteins. Okay, Proteins are probably, again, another really, really important biological molecule. You've, you've heard me say that before. But it's true, proteins make up about half of every cell in our body. Good examples of proteins that we need to learn about are, for example, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is one of those big quaternary structural um, proteins found inside the red blood, red blood cell that attaches um, oxygen. Again, that's another exchange of transport topic. Um, proteins also make up things like hormones, so things like adrenaline, noradrenaline, they are all made up of um, proteins. So as you can probably tell, they're really important. This is a, a diagrammatic or a cartoon kind of thing showing you the importance of proteins. We have things like DNA polymerase and enzyme. Enzymes are also made of proteins. Okay? Uh, in our chromatin, so chromatin is made of two components, our, our nucleic acid plus our histone protein. This histone protein is again really important in the formation of DNA. So you can, you can probably tell by now it's really important to understand. Let's get the basics out of the way. So proteins are a polymer. If we say protein, I mean the polymer version of a protein, and we call that a polypeptide. That's the, that's the best way we can call it, a polypeptide. Okay? And just like with all the polymers we've met in this topic, um, any polymer is made up of monomers. And in this case, in proteins, the monomer is the amino acid. Okay? If I was to join two amino acids together, two monomers together to make a dimer, that dimer in this case is called dipeptides, and three or more is obviously called your polypeptides. This is a really important point, guys. Um, the elements that are making up proteins. Okay? So we've talked about lipids. Lipids only have three elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Carbohydrates, again, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Many people get trapped over here. They don't understand that proteins contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, as well as nitrogen and sulfur. Okay, that's the only elements an amino acid or a protein in general can ever have. The reason we have this nitrogen and the sulfur comes down to the structures of the amino acid. Okay, let's draw, the, let's draw an amino acid. So the way to draw an amino acid, always start with the central C, central carbon. Around that central carbon, we have something called an amine group. This is your amine group. So again, if you do chemistry, ammonia, NH3, ammonium, NH4+, amine, NH2. On the other side, on the left-hand side, we have our carboxylic acid group. And again, these can be done uh, interchangeably either side is fine. That's your carboxylic acid group. And then we know that carbon needs four bonds. So we're going to have one hydrogen on top and something called the R group on the bottom. This R group is the variable group inside the amino acid, the variable group. By variable, I mean it can take on different chemical structures. And by chemical structures, I mean it can form different bonds. And these bonds are what we're going to talk about when we talk about the tertiary structure of protein. So this R group, for example, can have loads of ions. So it can make it an ionic R group. It can have loads of hydrophilic and hydrophobic um, groups from OH groups. That makes a hydrophilic hydrophobic, and that's a different type of bond in, in tertiary structure. It can have loads of sulfur, and sulfur and another sulfur amino acid, if they join together, you form a disulfide bridge. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And when we talk about the nucleic acids in our, in our, next, um, in our next topic, we're going to look at how nucleic acids make up um, make up things like mRNA. mRNA then goes on and it's used in protein synthesis. Here's a quick concept I want you, um, you guys to understand. Again, it's a multiple choice I've seen before. I'm going to tell you this fact that there's only 21 amino acids in the body. Okay? There's only 21 amino acids. That, that's a fixed number. Things like um, isoleucine, leucine, aspartate, cysteine, glycine. These are all loads of names for amino acids. We code for an amino acid using an ant anticodon Okay, from tRNA. And an anticodon or a codon in general is three bases. 
So for three bases, um, we can form one amino acid. So can anyone tell me how many possible combinations are there um, for all amino acids? If we consider there's um, four different bases, are A, T, C, and G, and we need three to um, make an amino acid. So four to the power of three is 64. So there's actually 64 possible combinations um, of, of bases in codons, but we can only make 21 amino acids. So there's far more codons than there are amino acids. And that demonstrates one of the characteristics of DNA called degeneracy, where several codons code for the same amino acid. And that gives kind of like a backup system when we talk about protein synthesis. Let's join two amino acids together like we've done for all the other, um, other polymers. So let's draw those um, amino acids again. So we've got a central C, amine. So the best way to revise this topic is to continually draw out these molecules so that it basically becomes second nature and you can draw them out really quickly in the exam and not waste time. So I want to draw two. That's my carboxylic acid group. And that's my R group. That's my variable R group. To form that peptide bond, the peptide bond's functional group looks a bit like this. Okay, just remember its structure. That's a peptide bond. That's our peptide bond. So again, to form, to join any two monomers together to make a polymer, we know it's a condensation reaction or releases water. So let's find that H2O molecule like before. Let's find H2O. So I can take that H, I can take that O and that H. Okay, I've made my water now. Whatever's left over is your peptide bond. So whatever's left over from releasing our water is our peptide bond. So if I was to redraw everything, what you'd get is this. That is your peptide bond. And I use this rule when I talk about joining any monomer to make a polymer. The way to remember it is always find the water first, because we know that's, that's a fixed thing that always happens when you join one together. Find the water, cancel it out, whatever's left over is your bond. So just like in lipids, when you take a, when you took away the H2O from the fatty acid and glycerol, whatever's left over was the ester bond. And same thing when you talk about peptides. And again, to form it, condensation, to break it apart, to make two amino acids. So again, a hydrolysis reaction where you put water in. So uh, this is basically what I've told you about before, um, how there's different combinations um, to form 64 possible combinations for only 21 amino acids. So proteins, um, that unique R group on amino acids gives proteins its specific shape and specific structure. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about the folding of amino acids into proteins. So proteins have a specific structure and this specificity comes into play when you think, for example, to, uh, think about enzymes, enzymes in the active site, the active site is specific to each enzyme. That specificity comes from the folding of amino acids into proteins. And this folding, there's four levels of folding. There's, there's four levels of this folding. There's something called the primary, the secondary, tertiary, and the quaternary structure of the protein. And these four words basically describe how the folding occurs. If you look back to your cell biology topic, you should be able to quote the organelles in order that are involved in protein synthesis. So we start with the, um, the nucleus, the nuclear forms, nucleus forms mRNA, exits the pores, attached onto either rough endoplasmic reticulum or ribosomes, that then goes through Golgi apparatus, Golgi apparatus, exocytosis, or the protein stays inside. So the primary structure is an important definition. The specific sequence of amino acids joined by a peptide bond to create a polypeptide. Just remember that definition, okay? This definition will come to play when you think about nucleic acids and protein synthesis. But that specific sequence of amino acids joined together during translation um, at the ribosomes, that's your primary structure, okay? And different proteins have a different sequence of amino acids, as we all know. Um, but that does present some problems, okay? So that, that sequence of amino acids is very key to getting the structure and the function correct of that protein. But the, when there are mutations occurring in that nucleic acid of DNA, that can cause the misfolding of proteins, the misfolding of this primary structure, and it can cause mutations. And there's several types of mutations, which are, we don't have time to go into now. But in general, you should know that there's two main groups. There's your chromosomal mutations, your DNA mutations. Inside your DNA mutations, um, you have something called indel mutations or insertion deletions. Then you have substitutions. So indel mutations always uh, cause a frame shift mutation because you're changing the reading frame. 
Substitutions can cause three different types. You can either get a silence mutation, you can get a nonsense mutation, or a missense mutation. So silent means um, you're coding for the same amino acid. Missense means you're coding for a different amino acid, only one different amino acid. And nonsense means you're coding for those stop codons like UAG, um, UGA, and UAA. But again, we'll come up. We'll come onto this uh, when we talk about nucleic acids. Does anyone have any questions before we move on? So if you have any questions, again, just write it on the Q and A. So secondary structure. So we've talked about the primary structure, a specific sequence of amino acids. That's happening, that's happening at the ribosomes. We then take that specific sequence of amino acids, put it into a vesicle, and uh, give it to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus, as we know, its main function is the folding, processing, and packaging of proteins into those Golgi or secretory vesicles. So in the Golgi apparatus, we get this secondary structure, which is that initial, that first fold of your specific amino acid sequence into either two structures, something called an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Okay? alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet. Don't get this confused with the alpha chain and the beta chain in hemoglobin. That's different things. Okay? The alpha helix forms a kind of helical structure and a beta pleated sheet uh, forms that kind of structure. And to hold those coils and those sheets together, we have hydrogen bonds all over the place. That prevents that unraveling of the secondary, um, the second structure back into its primary structure. So these are your hydrogen bonds and they're found in both the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheets. Okay, so our secondary structure, just to recap, it's the folding of that primary structure or the specific amino acid sequences in the Golgi apparatus into either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Our tertiary structure is probably the most important structure or level of structure in the proteins. So that um, secondary structure is alpha and beta pleated, so the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet can go on to do further folding. Uh, again, happening at the Golgi apparatus. And that further folding takes it into its final 3D form. So the tertiary structure is always a 3D structure. And what happens in the tertiary structure is you form more bonds, okay? You form four main groups of bonds, okay? And these, again, are happening between those amino acid sequences that we talked about, those R groups. So in your tertiary structure, you form either one of these four bonds, or all four in some cases. You form ionic bonds, which are basically the attraction between negative and positive amino acid R groups. Your disulfide bridges are between sulfur-based R groups. Your hydrophobic hydrophilic interactions are between OH um, groups, so there's hydrogen bonds. And again, you can also form hydrogen bonds. So hydrophilic hydrophobic interactions are things like hydrogen bonds, as well as things like um, how ions can repel water when we saw that when we looked at phospholipids. So just be aware of that as well. So uh, for proteins that only have one polypeptide chain, for example, ma the majority of enzymes, the majority of hormones, they are only made up of one polypeptide chain or one tertiary structure polypeptide. So that means the tertiary structure is its final 3D structure. But when we talk about more complex, uh, more complex proteins, for example, hemoglobin, Okay, hemoglobin is a, a structure we're going to look at in a minute. Hemoglobin is unique because it has a quaternary structure. Just remember that not all proteins have a quaternary structure. So quaternary structure basically means you're joining several polypeptides together, several separate polypeptides together, and we're joining them together. And we're joining them together using those bonds that we talked about in the tertiary structure. So those ionic, disulfide, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and hydrogen bonds. They form between the different polypeptide chains and join them together. Okay, so let's look at um, some poly, different polypeptides and how we can classify different polypeptides. So we've just looked at the four main structural levels. Now let's talk about these, these uh, polypeptides on a macroscopic scale. So a protein can either be one of two things, a globular protein or a fibrous protein. Okay? And this depends on which bonds are present at those different four structures that we just talked about. So for example, a fibrous protein, as the name suggests, makes it look a bit like fibers or entangled fibers. And globular proteins look, again, like a, a glob or a kind of like a ball structure. And the way we get fibrous and globular proteins comes down to one important bond. There's hydrophilic and hydrophobic interactions. So hydrophilic interactions means it attracts water. If it attracts water, it can now dissolve. 
So a good example of a globular protein, which we're going to look at in the next slide, is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has its hydrophilic um, interactions on the outermost surface um, of the quaternary structure. So if you have loads of hydrophilic interactions on facing the out, outer perspective of this globular protein, it can start to attract a layer of water. And if it starts to attract a layer of water, it then starts to dissolve in the blood. That's a, a really useful property of hemoglobin. It can dissolve in blood and it can dissolve in red blood cells. And that's all due to these hydrophilic ones being on the outer surface. Fibrous proteins are different. So they have a different structure. So majority they're going to form helices and stuff into pleated sheets. Um, but another main difference is that those hydrophilic bonds are on the inside. Those hydrophilic R group bonds are on the inside um, part of the fibrous protein. Whereas on the outer perspective, we have hydrophobic. We have hydrophobic interactions. This means it starts to repel water, which means it doesn't make it permeable to water. This presents some really um, useful properties when we talk about examples of fibrous proteins. An example of fibrous proteins would be keratin. Um, keratin doesn't dissolve in water, obviously your hair doesn't dissolve in water, because all those hydrophilic interactions are on the inside, hydrophobic interactions on the outside. Let's look at globular proteins. So this is just a summary slide of everything I've just been talking about. You need to think about the positioning of those hydrophilic, hydrophobic R groups, whether they're on the outside or the inside of this globular protein. So this is a typical example, hemoglobin. It's come up quite a few times uh, in past years. So let's look at structure of hemoglobin. So structure of hemoglobin. Uh, there's a couple important features that we need to know about. First of all, it's function. It's a quaternary protein, meaning it's made of several polypeptides. This protein is found in large quantities instead of, red, instead of erythrocytes and red blood cells. And their main function is to either bond or dissociate oxygen. So let's look at the structure. The main, things, the main point you should understand, it's made up of four polypeptides. Another key fact is it's a quaternary protein. And the polypeptides, um, there's two alpha polypeptides, polypeptides and two beta polypeptides, or two alpha chains, two beta chains. It also has something called a prosthetic group. So just like a prosthetic arm is, um, you're adding some kind of non, you're, you're adding a foreign object like plastic onto a, a living body. It's the same thing here. You're adding a non-protein component onto a protein. And examples of prosthetic groups could be things like ions, like uh, for example, Fe2+, plus. that's a prosthetic group, and it's the prosthetic group used inside um, hemoglobin. They're the main points you should understand. Let's draw um, hemoglobin a bit better. So, first of all, we have two alpha subunits. Again, these are not alpha helices, beta pleated sheets, they're different to those. We then have um, two beta polypeptides, or beta chains. They're your four chains or your four polypeptides which make up the quaternary structure protein. At the center, at the center of each of these uh, polypeptides, we have our Fe2 plus, our prosthetic group. And since this um, Fe2 plus is electron deficient, it starts to attract electrons from oxygen. That's how, that's how it allows it to bind. But again, we'll talk about this later when you think about exchange and transport. Let's just see if we've got any questions. Would I need to know the examples for AQA? Yes, hemoglobin's in all the examples. The ones I'll talk about next, I'll, I'll specify which examples um, they need to be remembered for. Um, copy of the PowerPoint, uh, again, it's on the, it's on the uh, there's a link on my Instagram to a shared Google Drive. So yeah, back to hemoglobin. So that's, that's the structure of hemoglobin. And since these Fe2 plus ions are electron deficient, they attract oxygen uh, reversibly. Okay, and again, we'll talk about this later on. That's hemoglobin, definitely need to know about this. Uh, if you're an OCR, you need to know about uh, insulin, insulin and amylase as an example. If, again, if you're an ACO, you only need to know about amylase, I think. But insulin is a hormone. Hormones, uh, this insulin hormone regulates blood glucose. And again, we'll talk about that when we talk about homeostasis. But insulin is made up of two polypeptides uh, with disulfide bridges. That's all you need to know about insulin. Amylase, uh, just like the majority of enzymes in the body are only made of one polypeptide chain. 
and its tertiary, its tertiary structure gives it this 3D structure. So remember, you cannot say that amylase, which only has one polypeptide, has a quaternary structure, because quaternary structures define as having one or more, sorry, two or more polypeptides joined together. So amylase is found in different parts of the body. It's, um, it's produced in salivary glands, um, also your pancreas, and it breaks down things like starch into smaller components that are more digestible. So uh, fibrous proteins, again, they have their hydrophilic R groups in the inner surface. Um, and one of the most characteristic things of fibrous proteins is they're, they have, they're made up of several tangled up fibers, which gives it its strength. Another typical bond you'd find are those covalent bonds. An example of a covalent bond would be your disulfide bridges, which are between two sulfur-based R groups of amino acids. So I forgot to mention, in globular proteins, typical um, characteristics would be they're, they're globular in shape, they're circular in shape, and they're very easily dissolvable. They're not as strong as fibrous proteins, and they make up the living components um, of the body, for example, blood, um, enzymes, hormones, those kind of things. Whereas fibrous proteins, they're the complete opposite. They're insoluble, strong, they have high tensile strength, which means you can't really pull them apart that well, and they're very flexible. Examples that you should know if you're on OCR are keratin and collagen. Collagen is, again, for all the other examples. But keratin is that thing found in hair and skin. Collagen is mainly found in bone crystallization. So bones are made of crystals of collagen and other phosphate-based ions. So if, if you've, so the girls out there, if you ever straightened your hair and you straighten it at a really high temperature, you get a really awful smell. That awful smell comes from the burning or the breaking apart of disulfide bridges in your keratin. Okay, so disulfide bridges contain sulfur. If you break them apart, you release sulfur. Sulfur, as you probably know, has a very bad smell, and too much sulfur can actually be toxic. That's why if you burn hair or you burn skin, um, keratin uh, is the reason why it doesn't smell too pleasant. So you also need to know about some ions. Okay, so you're gonna meet all these ions eventually in your um, career in A level. But let's just get the basics out of the way. So in your, in your textbooks, it's probably a, a huge page listing all the ions and their function. I'd say skip that page because you're going to learn about these ions in so much more detail later on. But generally, uh, I mean, all of you have done this in GTS, but ions are defined as having an overall electrical charge because they've lost an, a, a complete electron or they've gained a complete electron. And that's different to those partial charge we saw in water. So you need to know that cations are positive. And the way I like to remember it is cat per. So I say pers to, to try and reinforce that point. Um, anions, anions are negative. And there's several um, different ions in, um, that are really important in the body. Um, so you have organic ions, things that involve carbon, and you, you also have inorganic ions. Okay. All you need to do at this point is just remember the charges involved. So remember that calcium is a two plus, um, sodium is Na plus, potassium K plus, um, hydrogen ions is H plus. We've met phosphate before and we looked at the phosphate of the that's PO43 minus. Uh, but in general, things like OH minus, um, H plus, they're involved in pH balance. Hydrogen carbonate, we'll talk about when you do, when we're joining carbon dioxide and water and hemoglobin to make carbonic acid. Carbonic acid then dissociates into protons and hydrogen carbonates in that Bohr shift. That's where hydrogen carbonate is relevant. Nitrates and phosphates are used in plants for growth. Um, chlorides are used in that chloride shift if you're on OCR. Um, and that's the thing that's great. Calcium, calcium and sodium, potassium, they're mainly involved in muscle contraction. So in your A2 spec, you're going to learn about something called the psychoplasmic reticulum, the sliding filament model, um, how action potential are generated. That's where you'll meet those three ions. So don't worry about learning the function just yet. Just uh, be able to understand what cations and anions are and their charges involved. So we're coming on to the last bit of this topic, the testing for biological molecules. So if you're, on, if you're doing lipids, sorry, if you're on AQA, you need to know these. If you're on OCR, you also need to know these. Edexcel, I'm not really sure because some, I mean, the old spec had it, the new spec has some things missing. What I do is just remember them in case, okay? Lipids, lipids, um, to test for any lipid, triglyceride, phospholipid, or cholesterol, you do the emulsion test. Emulsion test, very simple. You get a test strip with a sample in it, add a bit of ethanol, so alcohol, add a bit of water and shake vigorously. If it's positive for lipids, you get a white precipitate or a white emulsion or a milky emulsion forming. 
And if it's negative, the solution remains clear as per this diagram. It's a very simple test. I'm doing all the simple ones first, and then the last one is probably the hardest. Starch, starch made up of two com components, amylose, amylopectin. Um, it's in things like potatoes. And to test for starch is the iodine test. So the iodine test is what you learned about in GCSE. But this test solution that you need to know about in A-level is called iodine in potassium iodide solutions. So what they do is basically dissolve um, the elemental form of iodine with an ionic form of iodine, uh, which is um, Ki or potassium iodide. And if you mix them two together, you get a more reactive solution, which reacts with the starch a bit better. So if it's a negative test or the actual color of this iodine and um, potassium iodide solution, it's about a brownie orange, somewhere in between. And that's what happens if it's a negative test. If it's a positive test, you get an inky blue and black color. Okay, that's the iodine test. Proteins, again, very simple. You're adding just a test solution. In this case, it's the Biorette solution. The Biorette solution has a couple steps because you need to actually form the Biorette solution um, and form its environment first and then add the solution in. So you add your test sample to the test tube. You make the test tube alkaline by adding sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, any base. And then you, after that, you add the Biorette solution, which is copper two sulfates, um, which is kind of a bluish uh, crystalline color. And the reason we have to add the sodium hydroxide again is to make it more reactive. Um, so again, if it's a positive for protein, uh, the solution goes from blue to purple. If it's negative, it remains blue. When you're quoting these color changes in, a, in the exam, you must give what it was initially and then what it changed to. It's no good just saying purple. You have to say it goes from blue to purple. Just remember that. Okay. Lastly, sugars. This is why I've left it, left it to the last. It's uh, a bit more challenging than the other things. So it's tricky because as we've seen in the carbohydrates topic, there's several different types of sugars. Okay. And I mean, this, is, this might not make sense right away, but there's two main categories of sugars. You either have something called a non-reducing sugar or a reducing sugar. And it all comes down to how they can either gain electrons or take away electrons. But don't worry about that. Just remember, there's two main groups of sugars, non-reducing and reducing sugars. Because reducing sugars are a bit more reactive, they have stronger bonds. So we need to give some extra steps to break those bonds first and then make it into a non-reducing sugar, which is normally quite reactive already. And um, that's probably one of the easier parts of this test. So non-reducing sugars, it's just a simple test. Reducing, you have to break those bonds first and then make it into a non-reducing sugar and then test for a non-reducing sugar. But let's go into all this in a bit more detail. So reducing sugars, reducing sugars are all monosaccharides, okay, so alpha, beta, glucose, and your disaccharides, uh, for example, maltose and lactose. The other disaccharides, the other polysaccharides, they're all non-reducing -redu sugars. So if you're testing for a reducing sugar, what you do, get your test sample, um, add something called Benedict's reagent, so it's the test solution. Add Benedict's reagent and heat it in a water bath um, for about 90, at 95 degrees for about three to five minutes. This is a bit of a variable one I've seen it on a textbook, but approximately 95 degrees for three to five minutes. And what happens if it's a positive test is you go from this kind of blue precipitate color to a, all the way to a red or brick red precipitate color. And it normally happens in a spectrum of colors, so blue, green, orange, and red. And this spectrum is, depends on the concentration of the reducing sugar present. So if it's a very high concentration, you get a brick red. If it's not too, um, if it's like trace amounts of reducing sugar, you get a kind of green, orange, or yellow um, solution. If the solution remains blue, however, however, it means it's a negative test. But we cannot say it's a negative test. Um, we cannot guarantee that because it can contain non-reducing sugars or no sugars at all. That's what we're going to test in the next um, in the next slide. So non-reducing sugars are um, there's all those disaccharides besides maltose and lactose, um, and it's all polysaccharides. All monosaccharides, remember, are reducing sugars. So you have to do the non-reducing sugar if the reducing test came back negative. You can't just ignore it and claim that it has no sugar at all. You must do the non-reducing test. And the non-reducing test is a bit more complicated because those extra bonds need to be broken down. Uh, let's see these questions. So for the test, you need to know about the exact amount of solution? No, uh, just say a quantity of. Uh, do we need to know about specific temperature of 95 degrees or can we just say heat the solution? I'd say 95 degrees to, for three to five minutes um, because that's what the textbook does say 
it's been, it changes between different textbooks. But I definitely mentioned that it's five degrees, three to five minutes. So what you need to do is first break these bonds in the non-reducing sugar. And by this, what we need to do is first add some strong hydrochloric acid um, into the test sample, and then we're going to heat it. So providing this really, um, really um, harsh environment to break down those bonds in the non-reducing sugar using strong acid and heating. And then you let it cool down for a bit, and then you have to get rid of all the acid you put in. So we neutralize it using a base, for example, potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, uh, sodium hydrocarbonate, just quoted a couple here. And then now that we've made any potential non-reducing sugar into a reducing sugar, we just do the same test as before. We do the normal reducing sugars test. So we add the Benedict solution, again, test for these precipitates in that spectrum. But now if the test stays, if the test solution stays blue, it definitely means there's no sugars present. No, uh, no reducing or no non-reducing sugars. This is a definitive test. So you must do the non-reducing test if the reducing test comes back negative. If you're an OCR, you need to know a bit about urine, urine dipsticks, which are um, how we test for things like kidney failure, um, diabetes, and you can test, uh, urine dipsticks can have um, various compounds on them, but urine dipsticks used in glucose testing has a bit of solid Benedict's reagent on it, and if you dip it, uh, you get spectrum of colour, which tells you the concentration of glucose in the urine. Um, having glucose in the urine is not a good thing, um, you you'll learn about that next year where we talk about um, the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule, and how those wider fenestrations allow more glucose into the filtrate and then into the urine, which means it's a sign of kidney failure or kidney disease. But let's go back to the Benedict's test. So what you've done here in the Benedict's test is look at colours. Okay, This is no good for scientific evidence. We can't just say it was green, it was orange. We need some kind of definitive numerical values or quantitative data. And the way we can make these qualitative colours into some kind of quantitative data is by using something called a calorimeter. Sorry, a, col a colorimeter. I will get mixed up. Colorimeter, uh, colorimeter, something else. So we use a colorimeter. And a colorimeter, what it does is it shines some light through um, the test solution that you just made. And it tests for absorbance or transmittance. That's what you set a setting at the beginning of the colorimeter. If it's either testing for absorption, absorbance or transmittance. And depending on that, we get a numerical value. So for example, if it's a, um, a very strong solution containing a lot of sugars, you get a really dark red precipitate. Um, a dark red precipitate is not gonna let a lot of light in. So you get a really low value for um, transmittance and a high value for absorbance. And then you can uh, plot that into a curve. So you can test several concentrations, plot that on a curve with the data from the colorimeter. And then you get something called a calibration curve, which means if you have an unknown, quant an unknown concentration of sugar or an unknown sample, you just read off um, the calibration curve. For example, this is what it would look like. You'd have a concentration over here and your transmittance or absorbance, and you get basically a curve. And if you don't know what the concentration is, um, you, give it, you test it in the colorimeter um, in a cubette, and then you just read off the graph, and then you'd find the approximate concentration. This is called a calibration curve. Um, TLC, we're going to come onto this when we talk about proteins next week. Uh, I, think, I think we'll talk about proteins next week, but we'll come on to TLC plates um, and things like the mobile phase and stationary phase next, um, next lesson. Okay, so we've come to the end of the lesson. So well done if you've uh, stuck, stuck till the end. Um, Hope you understood everything. We'll do a couple of questions if we have any towards the end. Just a couple of points I need to mention. So the free online webinar uh, or the free online budget course will remain free um, every week uh, for only the first 100 people that enter. Uh, the link will be posted on my Instagram story and on my bio. Um, it will be changing next week, the meeting ID and password. Just I'll, I'll make you guys aware of that later on. Um, but definitely follow my Instagram. I'll be posting updates on things like um, your application to medicine and other things like that. But we won't be covering all the topics in the A-levels. That's because there are several exam boards and there's quite a few differences between the two, so between the three boards. So we're only going to cover those common topics. And that's going to leave out quite a few topics. But I do have a mentorship scheme. So my one-to-one -one mentorship scheme that you've seen me talk about is sold out. So I don't have any more space in the one-to-one -one scheme. But um, I've introduced the group scheme because of quite a few people are asking. So if you're interested in getting an hour of weekly tuition one-to-one uh, -one or in a pair, um, I'm, I'm available for that. What you get is access to uh, really good exam questions for your board. You have full control of what topics we do when you do it. 
Um, you also get to um, contact me anytime during the week if you have any questions regarding your any biology questions or uni, uni application, especially if you're applying to medicine. This would be really good for you. Um, also, after one month, you'll get um, a personal statement service included. So I'll critique a personal statement, give it to two other medical students uh, who have got three or more offers to uni, and we'll kind of go through your personal statement in a lot more detail. This is normally a separate service, um, which is over here, but I do include it as part of the mentorship scheme. If you're interested or you have a friend that also wants to join as well, uh, DM me and we can um, get something sorted out for you. Okay, that's my personal statement service. Uh, you, it's on my Instagram if you're, if you're interested. Um, but what I offer is a 15 minute initial preliminary call to discuss your CV, how to put things, elements of your CV and best word it into your personal statement. We'll then critique your personal statement. I'll hand it over to two other medical students so you get a wider opinion base. And then I'll call you back again and we'll debrief any edits. So that comes, that's the end of our webinar. Thank you very much for joining this week. Um, let me know how that webinar was for you. DM me, I'd love to um, know any feedback, anything you would like more or less of. Um, that's my Instagram over there. You can also email me if you need to. So all resources that we've used are uploaded onto the shared drive. This lesson is recorded. So in a couple of days, I'll upload it onto YouTube, um, as well as all previous webinars that all I'm going to be on YouTube. So you can watch them back at your own time. And I'll see you guys next week at the same time, Thursdays at 5 p.m. If you've got any questions, I'll stick around for a couple of minutes. Anything, if it's related to biology or application, anything, let me know. I'll stick around for a couple of minutes. But otherwise, uh, thank you very much for joining. I hope you have a good week. Bye. Any tips to get A stars and A levels? There's several tips, um, there's several things I could say. Um, my biggest tips would be a little bit every day. Okay, get some kind of revision guide, get your textbook, set yourself goals. For example, by the end of the week, I want to finish this topic and go bit by bit and try and finish it at the end of the week. Set yourself goals, that's the best way to cover large amounts of content. Um, do a bit frequently and every day, that's the best way to get things to stick. Um, try not to do things like making notes again, a waste of time and you're not actively recalling the info. So reading the info daily, trying to quiz yourself, that's the best way to do it. What I like to do is um, write myself questions um, on things that I struggle to remember and then uh, get someone to ask me those questions and then um, I will remember them. The DNA mutations was confusing. Okay, so it's a complex topic. It's in the nucleic acids topic if you're on OCR, but an A2 topic if you're um, on the other specs. Um, don't worry about it yet. If you're interested, let me know. We can talk about it in a bit more detail, but... Um, at this stage, don't worry too much about the DNA mutations. Should I start covering year 13 content now? If you're in year 12, yes, definitely. If you're in year 11, don't worry about it. If you're in year 12, definitely. So normally what most schools do is do photosynthesis and respiration at this time. Those are two topics that I'd get, definitely get done right now. So that when you're going to September, when you're really stressed out with things like your UCAS, your UCAT, your interviews, um, you'd have a lot more time. So definitely do um, photosynthesis respiration this side of summer, get that out of the way, so we'd have a lot more time to do it. Uh, let's have a look. Do you recommend doing a timetable to get everything done? Uh, that's a tricky one. Personally, I don't recommend it. If it works for you, that's great. Um, timetables, I don't like doing timetables. I like to do to-do lists. For example, um, I set myself um, at the start of the day, I set myself a couple of things that I need to get done and I cross them off as I go along. That, know, that, that way I know that I've completed it. Um, set yourself deadlines, okay? Don't waste your time trying to make a really elaborate timetable, unless it helps you. But personally, I think it doesn't work for me. Just set yourself goals, um, long-term goals, short-term goals, and tell yourself what topics I need to cover at what points. Um, if you're applying to medicine, I do recommend getting your, your UCAT and your personal statement done very soon. Get that out of the way. Obviously, to the best of your ability, but try and get it out of the way soon. Don't uh, elongate your UCAT because it will start to get a bit tedious. Um, your personal statement, you can easily get done in a week and a half, two weeks, easily get it over with and forget about it. Um, so that's my, that's my personal advice. Do you recommend, uh, and do you know, if you've got any questions? Uh, I always stand by physics in Massachusetts. Um, I have exclusive access to OCR's exam builder and Edexcel's exam builder. Um, so if you're interested in getting questions of those, let me know. Um, but that's something I do offer in my mentorship scheme if you're, too, if you're interested. So, yeah.
you guys have any, have any other questions, just um, drop them in the chat. Doesn't have to be about biology, it can be about your uni application, medicine, anything in general, what uni life, uni life is like, anything. Uh, would you be able to add questions to the drive based on what we did so we can do them after? Um, the access I have to those exam builders, I can only give to uh, people in my mentorship scheme. If you are interested in doing questions that are available to everyone else, um, Physics and Maths Tutor have a really good set of questions and I can upload those if you want. Um, how do you choose your medical school? Um, I chose it based on where I live and also um, the style of teaching. Okay, so I'm a very hands on person. I don't like getting lectured too much. So I chose BARTS because they have something called a spiral curriculum, which means the curriculum is split into body systems. For example, our first body system was the cardiorespiratory system, then the metabolic system. So it's split into all the different body systems in the body. Um, and then every year it's built up on. So you get a increased knowledge every year. And um, the reason I like BART so much is because we have really early clinical contact. So for my first week, I was already in GP placements um, with my stethoscope and pretending to be a doctor. So yeah, you get a lot of uh, really good clinical contact, clinical skills. We've learned so many clinical skills, even in our first year. Um, there's really good opportunities to um, do extra placements. So uh, before lockdown, I was on a two week placement doing uh, neurosurgery and head and neck surgery. And it was a really great opportunity uh, to get in touch with really top consultants in in the UK. And I was actually able to do a bit of surgery myself. So it's, you, you get a lot of exposure really early on. So yeah, that's how I choose my medical school. Um, but yeah, the curriculum, how you learn, early clinical contact, those are the kind of things I look at. Also, if the medical school is associated with um, a hospital, so BART's associated with um, Europe's biggest healthcare trust, BART's Health. So we have access to a load of really top hospitals um, to choose from. Um, make sure your uni has access to a health trust, otherwise you won't get um, the best quality of clinical placement. So that's my advice on that question. Um, how did you decide what five years you go to? So four has to be medicine. My other one was a backup. Uh, my backup was biomedical science um, at St. George's because St. George's offers a transfer scheme from your second year into medicine. Um, so that's how I picked my final option. There's four unis. I told you how I picked my unis. Um, I recommend, uh, I mean, personally, I wouldn't do both the BMAT and the UK CAT because I really struggled with the BMAT. I wasn't very good at it. So I didn't end up revising for it at the end. So I think it's a waste. Personally, I'd say it's a waste of time doing both the BMAT and the UK CAT. Focus on either the UK CAT or, or the BMAT. The UK CAT is typically the easier compared to BMAT. So um, definitely consider that. Um, Again, I looked at rankings like other, other people. Um, I, I picked unis that um, considered my strengths and my strengths were my grades and my personal statement. My UK cat wasn't my strength, unfortunately, but I did pick unis that um, did take my strengths into consideration. So I, got, I had a better chance um, of getting the place. And I did in fact get three out of my four offers. Uh, dentistry or medicine or physio? Not sure what to pick. Did you struggle picking medicine? Um, did I struggle to pick medicine? That's a, that's a, a long answer. I'm not going to bore you with that right now. Um, it depends what you're passionate about. So dentistry is focused. Um, it's a very focused thing, a very focused subject. Um, you're going to basically be your own entrepreneur at the end, um, working in a dental practice or either in a dental hospital. You have the opportunity to open your own dental practice that appeals to some people. Um, that's how I'd pick dentistry. If you're passionate about um, patient interaction or really close patient inter interaction, one-on-one -on -one contact, those kind of things all appeal to dentistry. Medicine, I like it. It's very holistic. You're in charge. Um, you have really uh, a lot of responsibility on someone's life. Um, you have a, a wide range of specialties to choose from. So you're not really uh, pinned down to doing one specific uh, part of the body. You can actually explore. You have five years to basics, five, six, even seven years to explore what specialty appeals to you. If it's physio, uh, I'm not really sure about physio. Physio has its own benefits. Um, it's a really important career and the NHS employs a lot of physios and they're really, really crucial. Uh, again, physios, there are different types of physios. So you have um, some recovery physios, people that um, 
give you physio after major operations. I think that's quite interesting to research. So again, there's different types. Um, there's physios that deal with the elderly. So yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, range of what type of specialties you can choose from. But uh, the reason why I picked medicine um, is a unique thing to me. Uh, let's see. Do you recommend doing, uh, as work experience, do you think it's a good idea to write things from shows? Yes, so I've, I've done a, a really detailed post about what to do um, if you can't get work experience or haven't got work experience. I, I really definitely think that um, adding things from fictional documentaries are uh, a really good way to um, supplement uh, if you don't have any work experience. Uh, personally, the reason I chose to do medicine was actually looking at these uh, documentaries, 24 Hours and Any, one of my favourite documentaries, uh, so they call it Now to Save Your Life, uh, was one of the main shows that uh, inspired me to do medicine. So definitely you can include cases, patient cases, um, explore um, any research you did after the show. I gave an example of how to quote that in your personal statement. So definitely go on my Instagram and you'll um, see a whole post um, on that. I hope that will help. If you have questions on anything, just let me know. Um, we'll be finishing in about two or three minutes. <laughs>